Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on the Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything, only from jasonhartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome Robert Reed to the show. He is the author of Best in Travel 2011, and he is the U.S. travel editor for one of my favorite guidebooks, Lonely Planet. Robert, welcome. Thanks. Great to be here, Jason. So, a lot, lot going on in the world of travel today. One of the things I think people are looking for in today's economy is they're looking for uh, economical stuff where they can get the most bang for the buck. And with summer coming up, there are a lot of themes that you've sort of touched on for summer travel. What themes do you think are the best values? Well, I think one of those things that people might be wanting to do, maybe for the first time, is kind of get involved in this Civil War reenactment. So we're launching four years of big beards and wool uniforms and Civil War reenactments because it's the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. So as you, you're going to see them, the National Parks Service has a special website devoted to all the different Civil War battlefields. And so this is something that a lot of people kind of roll their eyes about and just kind of wish that Will Ferrell would make some kind of spoof movie about Civil War and actors and things like that, but they're actually really uh, a lot more interesting than you might think. I'm not necessarily a Civil War buff. A couple years ago, I went to Gettysburg, which is a fantastic National Park battlefield site, and, and saw a reenactment there and went to the site and things like that, and I talked to the reenactors, and basically I came away thinking that these are people that really are just trying to approach history from a different point of view and live it, and I actually learned more from it than I do from a museum. So, you know, this is 150th anniversary. It means a lot to U.S. history. And, you know, maybe if you're just going to stick closer, you don't want to pay big gas prices. Think about getting into one of those Civil War battlefields that uh, is going to be uh, turning 150 this year. So, yeah, with that, with that anniversary, that's a, a very timely kind of thing. One of the things you also talk about, Robert, is that Mexico is really safer than most people think. Yeah. It's, you know, there's a lot of people we've seen, you know, <laughs> Mexico is really in need of some some. <laughs> better PR. I mean, the two years ago, there was a swine flu crisis that most of it was focused on Mexico, uh, sometimes a little bit unfairly. And then we see a lot of reports about the drug war, which are really grisly details, some, some horrible things that are happening. And the State Department expanded its travel warning recently. But the thing is, is that actually 17 of Mexico's 31 states are not listed on the government's, uh, the State Department's warning. And so what that are those are the places that are deemed safe to go to and, in fact, is the places that people usually go to on vacation. We're talking about the beaches in Baja California and the south of Baja California or Yucatan, many of the beaches on the Pacific side, colonial cities like San Miguel de Allende, which is kind of an expat haven north of Mexico City. Even Mexico City itself is actually kind of cleaned up itself in the last few years. Washington Post last year did an article that talked about how the homicide rate is actually four times worse in our capital than in Mexico's capital. So I guess the, the thing is, is that if you choose where you go carefully, no, you don't want to go through northern part of Mexico. You don't want to drive into Mexico anymore. It's, it's not safe in those areas. But there are many areas where 
you talk to locals or people that have gone there, and the, these reports that we see feels as distant to them as it does from here. So there are places you can still go, and there are some deals because they're trying to entice people back. So I think that uh, there, there's so many places. It, Mexico is, is such a wonderful country, and so I just I feel bad when I see it sometimes that people are scared. And I get the question all the time: Can I go? Is it safe to go? And you know, I, I always say the same thing: that yeah, if you pick where you're going and you know research a little bit about it and go there, you're going to be fine. I mean, one of the places I talking about is Merida, which is in Yucatan State. And Yucatan State is just about three hours inland from Cancun, where you can get cheap flights. This is a real Mexican town, Spanish colonial town, near tons of Mayan ruins, all kinds of colonial churches. And on the weekends, they close down the whole center. It's like open-air dance and music and tacos. And Yucatan State is the safest state in Mexico. In fact, I looked up in Wichita, Kansas last year, which I think everyone would feel comfortable going to, had six, six gang murders last year, whereas Yucatan State, the entire state, had just two. So it's actually a safety record. It's actually cleaner than Wichita. So all I'm saying is, is that don't be too alarmed. If you're not comfortable, don't go. But there is more to the story than sometimes we see. And that's that's just my main point about Mexico. Right. Yeah, the news media has the tendency of making it seem like I, I'm in L.A. and we'll have an earthquake or a, a fire. An earthquake's a bad example. Actually, a fire, one of the fires that we always have. So, someone will call me, a friend from back east, are you okay You know, with the fire? Well, the fire's not anywhere near me. It's not even affecting my life at all. But that's yeah, just the way the media plays things, which is interesting. It's just about information just about getting the right information and making decisions for yourself afterwards. Absolutely. You always uh, also talk about slow travel and about how people want to get deeper into... A lot of people nowadays have been places, and they've mainly seen the quick overview, a couple days here, a couple days there, etc., and more of a trend toward people going in deeper and, and getting more uh, cultural yeah. immersion. This is a huge trend. Everyone's talking about trying to get local and go where locals go and kind of live like a local in a place. And, and maybe maybe take a break on the main attractions of a place and go to farmer's markets or secondary museums or just local restaurants and just kind of blend in with the local life. And you see this a lot. People are really wanting more from their travel, particularly if they're going back to places again and again. And I think that lends itself to really, really rewarding travel and often good value travel. Because if you go to cities like it's New York or London, you can go and stay in private accommodation. You can rent it from sites like Airbnb, that's B, N as in Nancy, B, or Home Away, or even finding uh, apartments on like Craigslist, for example. These are often much more space for half of the money of hotels. And what's better is you get connected with kind of neighborhoods. I mean, instead of staying near Times Square for $250, you could get an apartment for about 125 in Brooklyn which is the hottest place in New York City, and, and you'll be connected to, to where locals are. You'll feel like a local, and you kind of slow down, and you, you make your breakfast, and you kind of imagine yourself there. You start to understand the habits of the city. I was in London recently because I did a little research about the royal wedding, and I, I, uh, I went to Airbnb and found a, um, a home that I could stay at with these, uh, this wonderful couple in northern uh, London, a neighborhood called Muswell Hill, which is kind of in the hills in the northern outskirts in London, and uh, it's the area where the kinks grew up and I was always a kinks fan so I thought that I would uh, go to their old uh, stomping grounds and uh, if you remember the video Come Dancing sure, the, kind of the way the houses are I, I, like I, that. I, yeah. got a, I got a comment on that one of the best concerts I ever attended was the kinks they were great see yeah I mean I I, I was I had never seen the kinks but I I went and uh, I had to go to their neighborhood and I ended up finding a place. London's not the cheapest city, but I found a place for about $75. I had my own floor, my own room and bathroom, a big uh, English breakfast made for me. The couple that ran it were hilarious. They'd been there all their life. The man was an interior decorator, so the house was really nice. And they were just kind of like my London aunt and uncle, and I just felt so at ease. And I saw London, um, I've had the pleasure of living in London before, but I saw that that part of London as if I were almost living there and I found things that I could have never found without their advice and so it was it was inexpensive and it just really expanded my view of the place and I think that no matter where you're going think about that stay in a place longer because you start to get the tricks of how people are saving money or, or what they're doing that's different that makes the city or, or, or destination it's what it is it defines it and uh, well you can often be more comfortable you know so I think that uh, you know slow travel is a big topic. It's not just this, but this is a part of it. And I think it's uh, something to consider this summer. Gas prices are climbing like crazy and people are upset. They're upset that Obama won't let them drill in the Gulf and various reasons and speculators and whatever. But some people are still wanting to do road trips. And, and it, at times that can still be a very economical, especially for larger families or larger groups. Yes. What's going on in hitting the road for 2011? 
Well, I mean, I think that a lot of people will. I mean, airfares are also going up at the same time, you know. So, and if you are dividing up the, the gas prices by four or five, you know, or if it's a family and rather than paying for four tickets, yeah, you, you can obviously still save money. Maybe it's time when you think about slow travel, thinking about those places that you always drive through getting to somewhere else. You know, what's in the next state? What's a state park you've never been to? What's a, a, maybe a secondary town that maybe is worth looking at more? So maybe it's time to think about, you know, depending on where your listeners are, you know, thinking about something closer, but not, not making any concession to your travel experience and, and, you know, seeing it full. I mean, I Another thing to do, you know, again, if you're out in the east, is a lot of people are really taking advantage of the new fleets of budget buses, Bolt Bus and Mega Bus. These are really nice new bus services that are expanding. They have free Wi-Fi on it. They're very comfortable. They go regularly, and they connect towns that you don't need cars. So I'm talking about Boston, New York, Philadelphia, D.C. You can also continue on. They, they go to places like you know, Richmond and Pittsburgh, which I think is an underrated city. It goes up to Toronto. So you could actually, in a couple weeks, hit a couple of cities, historic cities that you don't need a car, there's good public transportation and walkable centers, and get around by bus. And these fares are sometimes $1 each way. Now, some of the summer fares are already bought up for $1, but it's like $10. This is really cheap. And um, I think more people are really starting to look again at the bus. And it, it can work for you, not necessarily going coast to coast, but uh, you pick a region and a place that you might not need a car and you might get more out of your trip using the bus. Yeah. So in other words, this is not the same old sort of stereotype of Greyhound. These have Wi-Fi. No. They're luxury yeah. buses. How do they do, how do they do it for a buck? They must be selling advertising, right? Is it the you know, Ryanair sort of philosophy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. We don't have those budget airlines the same way that Europe does, but this might be kind of a step towards that. I don't know their business plan. I'm sure they're much more savvy than I am, but there is a limited number of dollar fares. You, you tend to get them off season more. Okay. I was looking in summer and I wasn't finding dollars. And I was looking at like New York, Philadelphia, and New York, DC, and I couldn't find it. Baltimore is another city it goes to. And I couldn't find the dollars anymore, but I saw like nine to twelve dollars one way, which is much cheaper That's than a train. Amazing, and, it, yeah. and it's gonna be cheaper than a tank of gas, and then you don't have to worry about the parking tickets you'll get <laughs> probably in some of these places. And and it's just it's convenient. It goes, you know, center of town to center of town. Good advice, good advice. That's definitely worth checking out. What else in terms of road trips? Route sixty six, where you get your kicks. <laughs> yes. I think Route sixty six is um, it's like it's kind of like the, the it's our Trans Siberian, I guess. It's like a once in a lifetime thing. You kind of imagine yourself going Chicago to LA and Route 66. A lot of people don't realize that much of Route 66 doesn't exist anymore. It's been taken over by the interstates. But the most surviving miles of Route 66 is in Oklahoma. And in Oklahoma, I actually grew up in Oklahoma, so I know some of these roads decently well. But there's many remaining patches of Route 66. In fact, you can follow up mo much of the state. I think the best is between Tulsa and Oklahoma City, and it parallels a toll road that you don't want to have to pay the toll anyway. And it's hilly. It goes through so that eastern Oklahoma is hillier, has spillover from the Ozarks. And great old towns. My favorite is Stroud. And they have a place called the, Har uh, the, the Rock Cafe, not Hard Rock Cafe, Rock Cafe. And they have the Cobbler and Buffalo Burgers. And it actually had a fire a couple years ago, but they got themselves back up. And I just love it. I grew up in Oklahoma. I go and meet family there all the time. And we take this Route 66. It takes longer, but it's really scenic. And, you know, if, you know that's the kind of thing that if you're, you live in Texas or St. Louis or Kansas City or something like that, you want to do something closer. Maybe it's time to think about getting a piece of the Route 66, not going as far. And, and there's plenty. There's B&Bs and dude ranches on it and things like that. Don't need so to do the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, good. I think it's hard, yeah. Right. What about Canada? Beautiful country. You know, I am a, a, a big fan. I just read uh, uh, something that says that Americans don't know that much about Canada. They had a poll and, you know, something like uh, of, uh, of young people, like under 25, like less than a quarter know the capital of Canada, which is Ottawa. And I think that Canada is one of our great underrated destinations, internationally speaking, because it looms up there. Of course, the Canadian dollar is doing really well, so it's a little more expensive than it was a few years ago. But there's so much to see. One, the train is fantastic via rail if you want to go cr across Canada. It's, it's actually a better train than our Amtrak, and if you go across the Rockies and Alberta and British Columbia, it's the most scenic train ride that you can do in North America, and totally worth it. That panorama, observatory decks, and things like that. You go to Jasper, down to Vancouver, but there is a new road trip that I, and I mean new, it's just opened. It's the Trans Labrador. Now, <laughs> this is not the most uh, uh, accessible place. This is north of. It's kind of connected with Newfoundland, but it's a. Uh, uh, 
it's on the mainland of uh, Newfoundland's an island, and Labrador has a um, all these mining communities, and they have like summer icebergs that you can see in these these unusual towns that they're, they they have berry picking festivals and things like that. But they finally connected it by road. And previously, there was places that you had to go on these really kind of four wheel drive roads or fly into towns like Happy Valley, or, uh, Happy Goose Valley, and they have funny names like this. And um, I haven't done it. But I'm hoping I might be able to figure out a way to get that trip. And if you extend it for a few weeks, you could actually do a road trip with some ferries through Quebec uh, into New Brunswick, over by ferry to no- uh, Nova Scotia and by ferry to Newfoundland. And Newfoundland is, re- is an absolutely stunning place. There's Viking sites if you want to go see them and all kinds of things. But it's a really kind of a, an adventure that feels like you're being in the Arctic to some degree. And now you can do it by car. For the first time. So I think the Trans-Labrador Highway, for those who really want an adventure, should think about that. Yeah, great. What about New England? Yeah, New England, you know, a lot of people associate New England with going in fall, you know, but don't forget about uh, New England in, uh, in summer and, and away from the water. You know, one of my favorite roads is called the Ethan Allen Highway. 308 miles, and it goes straight up from Connecticut through the panhandle of Massachusetts into Vermont. And you you have like the Norman Rockwell Museum and great little shops like New Milford with antiques and things like that in Connecticut and up in Vermont, some of the best canoeing you can get in the Northeast, the Batten Kill River. Now, the reason why you might want to think about a road trip to New England, other than it being beautiful and, and, and so scenic, great little towns, is that it actually has the safest traffic record. There's the fewest wrecks, you know, in, in New England. So if you're concerned about going to a place that's too much traffic, it has, the, it has the safest record in New England. So that's an added bonus for being up there in summer. Good points. Let's kind of get out of North America here for just a moment and, and look at your prior travel experience, which is fascinating. As I mentioned to you before, I have this kind of morbid fascination with communism. I've always wanted to go to North Korea someday. I hope to do that. Been to Cuba, Russia, Eastern Europe, of course. But you've you've done the Trans-Siberian Railway. You've done mm-hmm. Myanmar and written about those extensively. Tell us about them. Yeah, I think that uh, going to places, you know, that's what travel is about sometimes, is going to places that are very different different or that are in transition. And in, in, in terms of Russia and Eastern Europe, you're talking about a place that's really in transition still. Uh, this December will be the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union. And the thing about it is you go to places in, in much of Russia or Eastern Europe. I've also done uh, a lot of travels in Bulgaria and Romania and different countries in Eastern Europe. You can really see remnants of that era. I mean, you can go and stay in old communist hotels that were built in the 70s. It was like the communist version of what they thought a holiday hotel would be, which is often not what our idea of a holiday hotel is. I mean, it's really uh, browns and beiges and gray colors and regretful choices for, for carpet and things like that. But I find it like being in a museum. You know, I find it fascinating. Some of them have been refurbished. They're very nice hotels. But some of them is really like stepping into the Brezhnev era. And I always try to do that one night here and there because it's just so fascinating, even if it's not the most comfortable. As far as the Trans-Siberian, it's absolutely one of the world's greatest journeys, and, and, it's, and it earns it. I think it's Russia at its best because Russians can be a little bit difficult to meet sometimes. And I think that there's a real misunderstanding between how warm and friendly the Russian people are. And what it takes is getting out of the kind of public sector. Like if you're waiting in line at the post office, you're not going to have the happiest people around you or the happiest people waiting up. I, I don't think you, have that. you won't have that in the U.S. either. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But, and, but the, the private sector of Russians, when you are invited into someone's home, or if you share a train carriage with them, they're going to treat you like family. I mean, I, I've had people immediately take my bag and put it away and put the sheets on my bed and sit me down and give me, you know, tomatoes from their dacha garden and, and pull out the vodka. I don't know how they got it and, you know, their bread and sausage. And they just treat you like family. It's just wonderful experiences. And that's kind of the point almost of Trans-Siberian uh, is that you have it's seven days from Moscow to Vladivostok if you take it all the way. And a lot of people cut south, you know, they go to Lake Baikal, which is really the great attraction. This is about four days east of Moscow, this massive lake. You know, it's like as big as all of our great lakes. It's much deeper. It's a stunning just uh, existence of just all of the, 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 the creatures that are in there and how deep it is and, just, and how clean it is. It's a fascinating place. It's rim by mountains and things. A lot of people go to Lake Baikal, they stop, and then they cut south into Beijing. I, I like going all the way to Vladivostok. And I think the reason is you're going from, you know, from Europe to parts of 
to parts of Asia that's further east than North Korea, you know, and Vladivostok. That's further east. And, and so you're talking about seven days on the train, but you can stop off in towns. And some of them are, they look a little bit like the communist area, I'll be honest. Some of them are not the most gorgeous. And other ones are, have a lot of buildings from the Tsar era, like Habarovsk, which is about six, five and a half days east of Moscow. It's a great Siberian town, Habarovsk. I mean, you have, it's on the river. And there's all these wonderful kind of, you know, hundred year old buildings and, and lots of new restaurants and, and you can take little river boat rides and it's a leafy city and things like that. It's really quite nice for a day or two. And, you know, of course, Lake Baikal, there's a town that's a little bit, uh, maybe about three days east of Moscow called Tomsk. And it's just off a splinter rail from the, the main trans Siberian line. This is a famous town for its wooden architecture. And it's kind of more of a small town with this historic center. And, you know, there's, there's a lot you can see, but I think it's more about the fascination of just crossing such a distance. And on one level, you know, you've gone from, from Europe to far, far, far east of Asia. And on another level, a lot of the towns look the same. I mean, a lot of it still looks like Europe. It feels like Europe. And you, you go to a town like Blagoveshinsk and you're looking across the river and you see China. You know, it's like, well, it's just kind of a, an amazing, amazing experience. And it's, it's possible to do on your own, though a lot of people do package trips with it, but you can do it on your own. It, takes, it helps to have a little Russian, I'll be honest, but really worth it. Really worth it, in my opinion, if you get off the train. Because if you stay on the train for seven days, you're going to get sick of it. I'm yeah, that, that, that's, that's what yeah. I want to ask you, because I've seen yeah. various movies about the Trans-Siberian Railway and so forth. And the trains are pretty primitive, aren't they? You're, I mean, there's no showers or facilities on them, are there? Well, you know, I think you're right. There is no showers on them. In the summer of, of Siberia, is far hotter than you expect. I would not recommend going in, in August, because it gets quite hot, and the air conditioning clicks off when you stop. So if you're stopped at 2 in the morning to 2.30 someplace, it starts to get warm. Even during the day, sometimes it's off and it can get hot. I mean, it can be 95 degrees in Siberia. A lot of people don't realize how hot it can be there in summer. I think that, you know, you go before or after summer, it's a wonderful time to go. But, you know, it's... Uh if you don't have the showers, a lot of people try to shower in the bathroom by connecting a tube to the sink and things like that. It's one of the reasons why it's worth stopping every 30 or 40 hours. But the trains are nicely kept up. There's a uh, there's a there's a pravodnitsa uh, that, that that runs the carriage, and they do. It's usually women, and they do a very good job of keeping things clean. They'll come in and vacuum your your carriage. You know, you have like a, either a two berth or a four berth uh, cabin on the train, unless you're in the the, the most basic. It's called plus carney, which would be the uh, just kind of general seats uh, in, in an open room. But uh, which I I always go for the the coupe class, which is it's four berths, and uh, you have a samovar at the end of the carriage that you go and you can make hot soup uh, or you can make uh, tea, of course, and things like that. Some of them have food service and stuff. So I find them very comfortable, though you don't, you don't expect some kind of Austrian or Swiss train with, a, you know, fancy showers or something like that. That doesn't happen. But you do have, you, you get, you know, your, your, your blankets and you get your sheets and your pillows. They vacuum it out. There's a lock on the door. It feels completely secure. I've had only positive experiences on the train. And it really, to me, is Russia at its best. And, and I'm going to ask, I mean, the scenery is gorgeous. I'm sure. I'm sure the answer to this question is going to be no. But Wi-Fi internet on the train by any odd chance? No, no, <laughs> I have a feeling no. no. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, no, I, no. I knew the no answer Wi-Fi. before I asked the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I like it. You got to be hopeful. Just, you know, just had maybe to ask that'll happen. Yeah. On the train, I mean, like dining cars, people socializing, uh, all of that stuff. Yeah, you do see that. I mean, you go to the dining car. I often would eat in the place because I become such friends with the people in my carriage. Like I was traveling by myself when I was researching the Trans-Siberian Guidebook and I would be by myself so you have like you know maybe a couple people that don't know each other with you or maybe it's three people that are filling it sometimes I had it by myself a little bit and you become friends with them and you end up hanging with, with them and they might have people in the next uh, you know cabin over that that come over too so sometimes you just have a little bit of a kind of a lunch scene in your place and you I believe me I had no problems meeting people, even if the language barrier was not a barrier. You, you, you meet people, people are really wonderful, and uh, almost without exception, people just uh, just treated me as, as part of their group. And, and I've got to ask you, who's on the train? I, I, you know, I just picture it being either backpackers or older people, yeah. not in the middle. I'll be right? honest, I've spent many, many days on this train, and I have seen only a couple tourists. I was almost only with it's Russians. It's pretty and, exotic, uh, you're the, sure. These are, these are people that are not taking it seven days. There's someone that's going Moscow to Novosibirsk in 48 hours. And in, the, in Novosibirsk, which I got off 
but if I hadn't, someone else would have come on, and that, that would have been my, my new little neighbor for a while. And so you don't see people, people are using parts of it, Siberians that are going from, you know, one town to the next, or, or truck drivers. I hung out with truck drivers that were taking the train to pick up their truckload in Vladivostok and then drive back. Those guys are hilarious. Let me just say that they did have the vodka flowing, those guys in particular. You have some families, uh, it really a mix of, of, of primarily Russians that were going on like between 12 to, to 35 hours. And again, this is a seven-day trip all the way across, so they're not they're only doing portions of it, generally speaking, from my experience. And, and so when you did it, did you go across and back, so you were 14 days? No, um, and I, I didn't do it consecutively. So I, I like when I started in Moscow, and I would go work my way on various train routes. There's another route that's parallel to the Trans-Siberian. After you get about halfway across Russia, it's called the BAM, the Baikal Amur Mainland, and, and this is a very obscure, a very remote train line that goes north of the Trans-Siberian, kind of parallel uh, through Siberia. And I did some of that as well. So I was kind of going back and forth between the lines because I had to go to various towns to research. Uh, so I didn't do it consecutively. I didn't do just Moscow to Vladivostok, and then I flew back from the east. Uh, so I only did it one way. And, and accommodations along the way, I'm assuming they would be pretty primitive, communist-style, basic accommodations? It depends. No? I mean, like I mentioned, you know, Vladivostok and Habarovsk, which are towns that were in my area, that you have boutique hotels in those places. And now, most train stations have Dom Otiha, which means resting house in the train. So if you're going to a place and you only want to be there, maybe you get there at 5 p.m. and you're going to take the next day a train at 5 p.m., you're going to be there 24 hours. Sometimes I would just book a room in Dom Otiha and in the train station. It was very inexpensive. Some of them were quite nice. Some of them, there was like eight rooms or eight beds in a room and you would take a bed. Some of them, you had your own room. Sometimes there was six beds, but no one else was there and you had it to yourself. And, and, and they were often very well kept up, a little clunky and old, you know, in a way, but very clean and very inexpensive. So if people that are just wanting to pop off for 10 hours or something, sometimes they use these guest houses that are right in the train station and keep your luggage there and not have to worry about dragging them across town. Those are pretty simple. But there, some of these places you have really nice, I mean, even towns you never heard of, Komsomolsk, which is kind of in a swamp on the BAM train line. This was founded uh, during the Soviet period by the, the Komsomol, which is the Young Communist League, and um, Waste, you know, great town. It was made to look like Petersburg, kind of a czar-style uh, era buildings and stuff. Really nice. There's great hotels there. A couple great, you know, it really surprises me. It's like, what? Yeah, it's pretty nice. You know, you spend on about 50 or $60 and, you know, perfectly fine hotel. It's been newly refurbished and things like that. I mean, the trains the trains are old, right? They're the narrow trains. They're sort of bumpy, right, right on the, old, the thinner tracks. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I like the bumps. You know, I find it very relaxing to sleep on a train like that. The BAM is a little bumpier, <laughs> a little uh, slower than the Trans-Siberian. So the Trans-Siberian feels like the finest Swiss train in a comparison to the BAM. I don't know the age of them, but they are not modern trains, but they are, I'm telling you, they are comfortable. They, they keep, they take a lot of pride. The Provenica that runs the, 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 each train carriage has a lot of pride in their job, and they really try to make you comfortable. They, they sell tea and soup and things like that, like I mentioned, and they clean it out. And I find that if you're expecting some kind of nightmare train or something, it really isn't. There are some train, like the, the, the Rosia is one of the train lines. It's better than some of the others. Right? So there's different train lines that are on it, and some are better, like the number one and number two trains are a little bit better conditions than some of the others that are more regional trains. And I did a mix of them, and I really have nothing bad to report about any of them And, and what, what's the price of that ticket to go seven days across the whole thing? You know, I don't know that price offhand. Um, I Because I, I didn't do it, um, I... The, 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 you know, the, the Russian ruble kind of goes back and forth. So some years it's a, it makes a little bit more sense for us uh, than it does other days. I'm, I'm guessing it's a few hundred dollars Not to go much. the whole way. Yeah, pretty, you know, pretty if you're, yeah, yeah, something like that. Now, the thing is, is a lot of people think that they can't buy tickets as they go. And it is a little tricky. If you stop off in Novosibirsk and then the next day you want to go to Novosibirsk to Irkutsk where Lake Baikal is or the access to Lake Baikal, it, it ta- it's a little bit of a challenge. 
I'll be honest, a little bit of a challenge. So some people will book all their tickets from Moscow agent in advance and, and you know, like point to point and then stay a day or two and then go point to point, et cetera. That's not a bad idea. Some people do the package trips, but that's the major hurdle is if you go, you really can buy tickets as you go. And this is something you couldn't do before. I mean, Russia was not a free place to just go and do anything you want. That's changed. You can do that. You can say, oh, no, I'm going to stay in Nova Sibir three days and extend your trip. You can do that, but sometimes the train lines, uh, the ticket lines are a little tricky. I have a little Russian. I, I study a little Russian, and without it, it might have been a little more complicated in some of those Siberian cities. But uh, you can pre-book those tickets. Uh, Moscow agents will, will help, and it's a lot easier to book it there. But uh, And some of the bigger cities, they're, they're easier than uh, others, too. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Want to know what you've missed in the Creating Wealth series? Well, here's your opportunity with Jason's five-book set. That's shows 1 through 100 through digital download. You save $288 by getting this five-book set. Learn all of the advanced strategies for wealth creation. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. Very interesting. We've been talking about what is formerly communist. Let's talk about what is actually communist, and that's Myanmar. I mean, what an exotic place, formerly called Burma. I mean, what what was that like? Yeah, this is a, a fascinating country. It's a, run by a military dictatorship, and a lot of people have not wanted to go there. Until last year, there was actually a tourism boycott there because of the government. There's been some like human rights abuses that's connected with tourism. In the, the mid-90s, there was a tourism campaign, and they used some you know, they forced labor to like build some airline uh, air runways and stuff like that. That was in the mid 90s. But since then, what has, some things have changed in Burma. And then I'll talk about how great Burma is because it's uh, it is a fascinating country. It's um, since the 90s. What we've seen is that tourism there has increasingly privatized. A lot of people didn't want to go because they thought the money was going straight to the government. And there was a time when it was much more difficult to control where your money went to because there was package trips and government-run hotels. And the government themselves, they were trying to get money from tourism like Thailand, their neighbor has, which is millions and millions of dollars. But very few people do go. And last year, the boycott was changed to just suggest that people don't come on package trips where it's harder to keep track of your money and to come independently. And so that most of your money can stay within the privatized sector with the locals themselves, who, by the way, have, of my experience, always wanted people to go. Now, the reason to go is it is a fascinating country. A lot of people speak English. It was a British colony for a while. and There's a legacy of people learning English. And it is a place that Thailand itself is a Buddhist country. And you have a lot of Buddhist temples and pagodas and things. And the Thai tourists go there because they say, no. Burma is really Buddhist. I mean, so there's a lot of very powerful 2,000-year-old pagodas that are covered in gold leaf that are very, very important to the people there. And to go and visit them is quite a powerful experience uh, in like Yangon, the former capital, and things like that. There's a place in mid-Burma called Bagan. And Bagan, I don't know if you know Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Have you been there? No, I've never been to Cambodia. It's, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful archaeological site. Uh, it was in the Tomb Raider movie with uh, Angelina Jolie. And, it's this, uh, and Bagan is kind of the Angkor Wat of, of Burma in a sense, that it's this giant plain with all of these old, like 800, 1,000-year-old temples that are just kind of left in the plain along the Irrawaddy River. And you can get around by horse cart or by bike. Some people go by the car. And it's a vast plain. And some of these temples, you can just go in by, and there's no one there. And there's hidden stairways and you can go up to the top and you have this unbelievable view. It's a fascinating site. Very historical. You know, it's a popular tourist destination in Burma, but very, very few people really know about it. So the, the, the amount of access that you have to it is, is really remarkable. That's one of the great attractions. But I think that the main thing about Burma is really the people. There's a lot of, it, it feels like going back in time. Uh, men wear uh, these longji or like long skirts. Uh, women have tanaka, which is a, a, a tree bark paste they apply to their faces in, in various shapes that's used as kind of a a sunblock and as a perfume of sorts. People are chewing beetle juice and uh, beetle nut and spinning it all over the place. And people get around by bike. They get around by ox cart. Uh, it's a very basic. Uh, people are, are quite poor there. Some towns only have electricity for an hour a day and things like that. But people are so sweet. They'll just stop to you. Hey, and they'll call your brother or sister. Brother, want to have some tea? And they'll, they'll have, speaking stop, English. Speaking English. 
Yeah, a lot of people speak English because uh, uh, many, many people speak English because it, it was a British clo- uh, colony for a while, and uh, and I think that there's just that legacy of people still speaking English, and so you'll find more people speaking English there than you would in some countries than you know that are around it, for example. It's fascinating. It's it's about how wonderful and sweet the people are about staying in a tea house and just kind of getting really lazy with the local way of life, which can be a lot slower, seeing some temples and things, a lot of bizarre things, or, you know, snakes at temples and, you know, Buddhas with big big glasses on them and all kinds of unusual things that uh, that you just, it's it seems magical. And after a while, you just start to believe it. Yeah. I believe all this. This is amazing. And uh, so it's a fascinating country. And I think that things might change for that since the tourism boycott ended last year, that more people will be willing to go and to go uh, uh, travel independently and keep most of the money in the private sector where people really could use it, to be honest. When you say tourism boycott for Myanmar, what do you mean? You mean the government wouldn't allow tourism or did the, t- no, the no. tourists were boycotting because of the human rights violations, right? That's what you meant? Thanks for asking. Yeah, that. I just Thanks wanted to clarify that. that. Yeah. yeah, the government, uh, no, was really trying to encourage tourism for a while. And after a while, they kind of stopped because they get most of their money from, from trade, various hydroelectric plants, uh, uh, gas that they do with partnership with their neighbors, Thailand, China, also India and Russia and Japan. And that's where most of their money comes. So they've, they're less interested in tourism, though they are open to it. They allow, they allow people to come and they encourage people to come. The boycott was from outside groups from a political point of view that uh, uh, because there was a uh, an election in the 80s where the National League of Democracy won the election, but the, the, the generals never handed over the power. And so there, there, that was where it be, uh, was one of the reasons why this started. And um, it, it basically, uh, a lot of people really argued for years whether it was effective because they were making so much money from their neighbors on different things. And there's a lot of different opinions about that. And to be honest, Lonely Planet just kept doing the guidebook and trying to explain how people can go independently and keep most of their money away from the government if they wanted to go. And we tried to spell out both sides to it. Here's what's negative about going, or a lot of people say is negative. Here's what the boycott is, and here's why some people say that you should go and let people make their own decisions. But that changed. That did change. Aung San Suu Kyi, which is the leader of the National League of Democracy, was under house arrest for a while. She was released last year. The National League for Democracy changed its boycott. And so now it's possible more people, will, I, I expect the numbers to, to increase, um, not to Thailand numbers, but increased considerably for Burma uh, this year. I, I mean, I picture that as one of those places that I'd be a little bit scared to go, like going to Iran or North Korea. You felt safe there? Yeah, there's really, I mean, I don't mean to dismiss it. There's problems in Burma, and there's problems particularly in the border zones and mountainous areas between various hill tribes and the government. And those are places that, uh, for better or worse, are really not open to tourism. Many of them are not. And some of that is because of infrastructure. There's no roads, and some of it because it's restricted to travel. The heart of Burma, where the the Bamar uh, or the Burmese majority live in, in general, is very open to travel. It's not like North Korea where you have a structured tra- a trip or the old Soviet Union where you had that every day planned out. You can really kind of do what you want, to be honest. You can kind of go where you want to go. It's, it's more free than I expected when I went. I've been a couple times. As far as safety is concerned, I never felt anything whatsoever. I, you know, It's possible that uh, some government people will keep tabs on people. I've never heard of anyone uh, well, I, there has been a couple uh, foreigners that have been arrested, and they actively did politics. They were handing out leaflets and speaking out politically. It's not smart to do that for a couple of reasons. One, you can get them thrown in jail, and they were eventually released. Another thing is it implicates the people around you. If you have a, you know, a trishaw driver take you to some political place he's, or, or he's start talking get openly, too, right? he so, could get yeah, in trouble. Yeah, yeah. That's the re- that's the reality, and that hasn't changed. So you have to be careful about what you talk about. But if you go to a tea shop. A lot of times, let the locals lead the conversation. If they feel it's safe to talk about politics, that means they want to, and you can, and they feel it's a safe place, and they will. That will happen. But you just have to be a little cautious about that. And, you know, that may sound scary to some, and that, that's and I understand, so some people won't want to go. I can say from a safety point of view, never felt any kind of risk whatsoever. I wasn't there for, you know, to talk politics. You know, I had conversations when they were started by locals in places they deemed were safe. Uh, let's wrap up maybe. I, I know we've got to conclude here with, with the subject of safe travel. And you talked about Mexico. Of course, we talked about Myanmar. On your list, though, Denmark and New England? What? <laughs> yeah. Well, we talked about New England earlier because it's like the, 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 the traffic, you know, like as far as like road trip, you know, getting into a car crash is actually a greater risk probably for a lot of travelers that are driving a lot than anything. Is that because they have no fault insurance still? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. But um, I think that Denmark is. I got the pleasure to go to Copenhagen last fall. I Great place. I it love it Copenhagen. is one of the yeah. it's so nice. It's beautiful. It's one of the safest cities in the world. One of the safest countries in the world. And the thing is, what I, I noticed is, is it not only is it beautiful. Everyone gets around. A lot of people get around by bike, and they don't wear those silly spandex outfits. They just wear their normal, <laughs> normal attire. Because I'm always embarrassed to wear the spandex stuff. But they have bike lanes everywhere. Your hotel will probably have them. You have 1,500 free bikes the city offer. You can go around. It's so wonderful. But the thing is, it's so safe there that locals do something that may stun you. And that is they have these old-fashioned baby carriages. And if they go into a grocery store to get some things, they just leave the baby on the sidewalk. Wow. That's how safe it is in Copenhagen. I mean, it's it's very different. And to me, I could not ever imagine doing that. But that's that just says something about how it is. I think it's so wonderful. Food's great. So much to do just by just riding around on a bike. You can go up and see Hamlet's Castle at Elsinore in the summer. They put on Hamlet there. It's like about an hour by train north of Copenhagen. It's 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 a great great place. I think a lot of people forget about maybe. Uh, and it's it's a Scandinavian town. A lot of history. It's compact. It's it's pretty flat. So it's easy to go around by bike and. It has like the safest record, really, that you can find. So if you're concerned about that, and for any reason it's worth going to, but that would be another reason to go to. Good stuff. Well, I, I definitely agree. I'm a huge fan of Scandinavia in general and Eastern Europe, so great places. Well, Robert Reed, thank you very much. Robert Reed, Lonely Planet. You're the U.S. travel editor. Anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Well, I just hope everyone has a good trip. I think that going to new places is underrated because if you think about going to the same place over and over, that's fun. But I think every three years we should go to a new place because uh, it's. Uh, I actually am trying to research this. And scientifically, when we go to a new place and maybe a little bit of an exotic place, it makes us like a kid again and it expands our memory. So we can five days feels like ten days. So get more out of your trip and try something new. That's, that's my advice to everyone. I think that's great advice. Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate the insights. Thank you. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.